and welcome to Games as Lit 101. All art mediums grow and change over time, but for how briefly video games have actually existed, they have some pretty distinct eras. Much of this is due to the prevalence of consoles throughout the medium's history, making it easy to separate the medium into generations based on the different technological capabilities of the time. We have the 8-bit era, the 16-bit era, the 3D era, and so forth. And at the end of these eras, we often have one or two excellent works that provide an effective capstone for it all. Chrono Trigger is possibly the most notable example, a game that brings the popular conventions of its era to near perfection and effectively embodies the Super Nintendo era of gaming, especially in regards to its own genre, which was itself quite popular at the time. More recently, these eras of gaming have become a little more subtle in their differences, relying a little less on technological advancement to distinguish them, and more on design philosophies and popular trends of the time. And if we were to single out any one specific game that would serve as an effective capstone for the last generation of video games, it would probably be The Last of Us. The Last of Us was released by Naughty Dog, creators of Crash Bandicoot, Jack and Daxter, and Uncharted, in 2013. It was their first M-rated game, as they had sort of a gradual ramp in maturity from the silly fun of Crash Bandicoot, and it brought with it a mature story that left players and critics alike absolutely floored. Its praises are still being sung, and it won more than its fair share of Game of the Year awards. Many consider it to be the absolute best of its generation. And there seems to be no better time to look into it than today, or... Uh, technically a couple weeks ago because of the delays and stuff, but who's counting? When Games as Lit 101 turns one year old. Yep, I've been doing this for a whole year now. It was a very, very slow start, but I've got some awesome fans, and now I finally have a decently sizable audience, so I think it's worth celebrating by taking a look at one of the most beloved games of the last few years. Though The Last of Us has a post-apocalyptic zombie-esque setting, which is hardly original at the moment, its writing, characters, and presentation give it far more complexity than the genre usually affords. We'll explore themes of family, morality, and parenthood in some painful and conflicting ways. This analysis seeks to dissect these themes and help viewers gain a deeper understanding of what the game means and how it imparts that meaning. As always, spoilers abound. I will be talking about the entire game, the story from beginning to end, and as I'll illustrate, this is an experience far more powerful when played than simply viewed or summarized. And beyond that, there are a lot of subtleties and nuances of the story that obviously can't really be captured in a summary like I'm going to give, so I highly recommend that you actually play the game before watching this analysis. I'll also throw out another warning, because The Last of Us is rated M for Mature, and has some adult language and graphic violence. As always, I'll keep my own presentation accessible to all ages, but we can't really talk about The Last of Us without acknowledging, discussing, and showing some of this content. So, with that out of the way, let's dig in to The Last of Us. If you've seen any of The Last of Us, it's probably the opening scene. The opening cutscene shows Joel and his daughter, Sarah, enjoying life at home. Here. What's this? Your birthday? You kept complaining about your broken watch. So, I uh, figured, you know. You like it? I think this is, it's what? nice, but I, I think it's stuck, it's not. What? No, 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 no. Oh, ha, ha. Where did you get the money for this? Drugs. I sell hardcore drugs. Oh, good. We started helping out with the mortgage then. Yeah, you wish. But Sarah wakes up in the middle of the night and everything starts going wrong. This is an excellent sequence, putting us in Sarah's shoes as we see the disaster unfolding around us. It really captures the horror of being a lonely child in a dark house as the world starts crumbling around you. Some commotion coming from I'll talk later about the game's use of perspective, but for now, just keep in mind that the simple fact that we're playing as Sarah for this sequence is really important. Joel is forced to kill their crazed neighbor in self-defense, and his brother Tommy shows up to get them out of there. It's worth mentioning, though it is admittedly something of a side note since it doesn't really have anything to do with the story's themes or characters, that Naughty Dog is a master of little details and nuanced animations, and that really helps sell the atmosphere of this game. 
Look at how Sarah walks. Most games would have just used a normal walk cycle here, but look how sleepy her movements look. Notice how you don't just move the camera when you're in the car. Sarah adjusts to look wherever you are. It's these little things that most games would overlook, but that really make the game feel far more real than it, of course, actually is. Everyone seems to be going crazy, and Joel and Sarah barely escape, but unfortunately, it all goes awry. Broken. Stop right there! Okay. We're not s sick. I've got a couple of civilians on the outer perimeter. Please advise. Daddy, what about Uncle Tommy? We're gonna get you to safety and go back for him, okay? Sir, there's a little girl. But... Yes, sir. Somebody we've just been through hell. Okay, we just need... Move your hands, big. I know, baby, I know. God. Listen to me, I know this hurts me. You're gonna be okay, baby, stay with me. All right, I'm gonna pick you up. I know, baby, I know it hurts. Come on, baby, please. I know, baby, I know. Sarah. Baby. Don't do this to me, baby. Don't do this to me, baby. Come on. No. No. No, 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 no. Obviously, none of this is as impacting with me skipping through it and narrating over it, but this scene is famous for its emotional impact, and it owes much of its strength to the interactive sequences that led up to it. Like I said, we'll get to that later. As you might have caught on, this is the zombie apocalypse of sorts, though it's not zombies as we know them. It's a natural infection caused by the cordyceps mushroom. That's an actual thing, you can look it up. It emits spores that basically turn small insects into zombies, and the apocalypse of The Last of Us is caused by this mushroom doing the same thing to humans. Typical zombies are not, if you inhale the spores or get bitten, you've got about a day before you go crazy and lose yourself entirely. So cut to 20 years later, and many of the remaining humans live in quarantine zones under strict martial law. The military controls who enters and leaves, and if anyone's caught outside, they test them for infection and kill them if they test positive. You don't like that. No. I'm not infected! Hold no, her down! Hands wrong. Do it! Please! No. Eyes forward. Alright. She's down. Fuck this! Oh shit! Shut up! Consider yourself lucky. What happens when you hide out in a death building? A resistance group called the Fireflies has been using guerrilla tactics and borderline terrorism to fight the military, and the tensions have been running pretty high. Joel is a smuggler, along with his partner Tess, and a job gone south ends up entangling them with Marlene, leader of the Fireflies. They're tasked with taking a 14-year-old girl, Ellie, out of the city and to a Firefly checkpoint. Neither of them particularly want to do it, but it's the only way to get them out of the position that botched job put them in. At first, Ellie is little more than a burden, a requirement hoisted upon Joel and Tess. Christ. Just cargo, Joel. And Joel is resistant to any relationship with her beyond that. But it's more than simple detachment. Joel is actively afraid of growing close to Ellie. He still wears the watch Sarah gave him, despite the fact that it broke somewhere in that 20-year period since the outbreak. He's become jaded, and it's implied multiple times that he's done some horrible things in the name of survival, not to mention the literal torture and murder he and Tess perform early on. You just give me a couple of <laughs> ah! Ah, The only connection he seems to have maintained is Tess. Though the nature of that connection is uncertain, it's certainly something of a mutually beneficial partnership, and it's made clear early on that he worries even for her safety to the point of doubting her, despite the game making it clear that she can handle herself pretty well. So I'll take one guess, the, uh... Whole deal went south and the client made off with our pills. Is that about right? <laughs> deal went off without a hitch. Enough ration cards to last us a couple of months. Easy. Basically, at the start of this story, Joel's morals are defined by little more than survival, and he has a very active fear of losing those close to him. The result when he meets Ellie, then, is to avoid getting close to her so he can't fear losing her. 
As we go through his character and his relationship with Ellie, we'll see that while many stories might use a tragedy like the death of one's daughter to simply drum up sympathy for the protagonist, Sarah's death actually is a serious influence on Joel's character in a number of very important ways, and not just at the beginning of the story either, but we'll be seeing more of that as we go through. Ellie's a bit more of an enigma at first, but she comes across as brash and precocious. She's clearly seen some stuff and understands how this desperate world works, but at only 14 and relatively naive, she still hasn't become all that jaded or distant, and she's not yet used to killing. Oh, fuck. I thought we were just gonna hold him up or something. She whistles, comments on interesting things she sees in the ruins, and even geeks out a bit over garden gnomes. Hey, look. <laughs> Gnomes? Yeah, those are gnomes. Man, I had an art book filled with these. I always thought they were super cute. <laughs> Even though she takes a while to warm up to Joel and Tess, she doesn't really hold back or avoid communication like Joel does. Really, she's kind of an open book. Now, it's important to note the role that Joel is placed in, not just in relation to Tess or Ellie, but even to the player. Joel is the protector, and the game establishes this very strongly right from the beginning through the very clever use of a narrative tool we'll be talking about a good deal over the course of this analysis. Perspective. While Sarah's death in the beginning of the game is certainly sad, the most impacting moment of the game's opening is the whole earlier sequence where you play as Sarah. It's more subtle, and you may not even realize what it's setting you up for, but it's using the game's interactivity to set a precedent in your mind. In this scene, playing as a young girl who can't really protect herself while the world is going completely crazy around her, the player's first connection with Joel is forged, and it's based on his ability to make everything alright, to protect us. Again, it's subtle, enough that most players probably don't even realize it's happening, but it effectively cements Joel's role as the one who will protect us, and by extension, others. Most importantly, Ellie. This is an example of minor narrative interactivity, which I've talked about on this show before. Essentially, this is when a video game uses interactivity to strengthen its storytelling without allowing you to alter the events of that story. The Last of Us is one of the better examples of this I've seen in recent years, and we'll definitely be coming back to the concept later in this analysis. But this role of the protector sticks with Joel throughout the game. Tess seems to be the brains of their relationship, and while she can certainly handle herself well enough, Joel's role seems mostly to be backup. She calls most of the shots. And so, of course, when he's put in charge of Ellie, this protector role is a natural fit. Ellie needs his protection, and he's forced to give it. Even better, the stakes are raised when it's discovered that Ellie was bitten three weeks ago and hasn't succumbed to the infection. In other words, she's immune. Even if Joel is highly skeptical, his protection has now taken on far more importance. The player, as I mentioned earlier, has been psychologically acclimated to this role for Joel by the opening sequence, and steps into it without hesitation, immediately drawing a parallel between Sarah and Ellie as the one they must protect. The same parallel that causes Joel himself to fear any relationship with Ellie. But this dynamic of Joel as Ellie's protector changes by necessity when Tess dies. She's bitten, and when the Fireflies at the Rendezvous Point are found dead, she pleads with Joel to finish this and get Ellie to the Fireflies, and stays behind to stall the military as her final act. This was three weeks. I was bitten an hour ago, and it's already worse. This is fucking real, Joel. At first, Joel's role as Ellie's protector is actually kind of reinforced. Tess is apparently a bit more capable of hope than Joel is, and her final request gives him a reason to continue protecting Ellie and leading her to where she needs to go without compromising his desire to remain emotionally distant. So Joel is still protecting her at the moment, but in the long run, he has lost a partner. The Last of Us has a number of gameplay mechanics focused on teamwork. Sometimes you'll give Tess a boost so she can get a ladder down to you so you can continue on. Other times you need two people to lift a heavy object, and other times Tess will stealthily kill a target at the same time as you. These simple gameplay interactions emphasize a partnership, similar to what we saw in Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time. This is a mutual relationship, and however capable Joel is, losing Tess means losing an equal. Ellie is, at this point, not experienced enough to fill that role, and thus Joel remains the protector, but that can't last forever if they want to survive. All this setup is followed by a long trek to find the Fireflies, with semi-episodic objectives that develop the characters and themes of the game leading up to the third act. Overall, The Last of Us is one long journey that takes place over the course of about a year, and the second act gives us thematically relevant snippets of that journey, punctuated by secondary characters that give us context for Joel and Ellie's own relationship. 
And that leads us to Bill. He's the first example of a relationship outside of the main characters that informs the story's exploration of human relationships, and the issues he faces are pretty specific to where Joel and Ellie are at this point in the story. As I said earlier, Joel is afraid of becoming close to Ellie, specifically because he's afraid of then losing her, as he did Sarah. Bill is the natural conclusion to this mindset. Uh, Ellie. Hey, what are you... Joel? Bill! What are you doing? Bill! Turn around and get on your knees. He's paranoid, socially inept, and obviously quite lonely. But he's alive. He talks about the importance of not letting others drag you down, and sees other people as a burden at best, a danger at worst, citing the story of how he left his partner to keep from getting dragged down. Seriously, you gotta take that kid back to where you found her. I can't just take her back. Then send her packing, let her find her own way. But let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, I had somebody that I cared about. A partner. Somebody I had to look after. And in this world, that sort of shit's good for one thing. Getting you killed. So you know what I did? I wisened the fuck up. And I realized it's gotta be just me. Bill, it ain't, it ain't like that. It's bullshit. It is just like that. It's easy to see this as a stereotype, but Bill is portrayed more tragically than most similar characters. Oftentimes, characters who reject companionship in these kinds of stories are really awesome, and their insistence on working alone is usually cured by the power of friendship or some similar character arc. Even the Doctor goes through this on occasion. Bill, on the other hand, while obviously quite competent at staying alive, is portrayed the entire time as a pathetic figure, bordering on insanity from long periods of paranoid isolation. But even more, he doesn't learn the power of friendship like we usually expect from these kinds of characters. When he comes across the body of his partner, Frank, bitten multiple times and hung from a ceiling to stop himself from becoming one of the infected, he's visibly shaken. He was obviously very close to Frank, and given Ellie's discovery later on... I'm sure your friend will be missing this tonight. Mm -hmm. Light on the reading, but it's got some interesting photos. Now, now Ellie, that ain't for kids. Whoa! How... how the hell would he even walk around with that thing? It's a fair assumption that I mean very, very close. Finding Frank's body is obviously affecting him, especially if you find the suicide note and give it to Bill. And yet, he's so entrenched in his way of thinking that this only seems to further convince him that he's better off alone. Well, that's how you feel. Well, fuck you too, Frank. <sighs> Fucking idiot. He left Frank because he felt the fear of losing him was weighing him down. Now Frank's dead, and Bill does indeed feel sad and confused. In his mind, his sad, lonely mind, that just validates every decision he's made. Through Bill, we see the dangers of choosing isolation and abandoning others out of fear. And in a final twist to the knife in this tragedy, he only sees these events as confirmation that he was right. For Bill, there is no us, there is only himself, and such a selfish, cowardly outlook led to an unhealthy relationship that ended in tragedy. At this point in the story, Joel is very much still resisting any real relationship with Ellie. We can see it in the way he reacts to her love of gnomes. All right, man. The way he continually brushes her off when she does basically anything. Fuck you, you handcuff I you. need you to shut up, all right? and the way he completely stonewalls her when she tries to talk about something difficult. Hey, look, um, about Tess, I, I don't even know what Here's how this thing's gonna play out. You don't bring up Tess, ever. Though that last one admittedly is telling of his own weakness as well. He'd rather just try and leave pain behind him than deal with it in a healthy way. And that's why Bill's example is so important. At this point in the story, Joel is kind of in danger of becoming like him, avoiding all human connection for fear of eventually losing it, and perhaps even causing the loss of that connection as a result. And while Bill may not necessarily see the tragedy of his own actions, the message does seem to be getting across to Joel fairly well. The difference is evident. He can talk with her a bit more comfortably. He begins working with her in some ways as a partner, rather than as something he needs to protect, and he begins trusting her with more and more responsibility. He's even a little more honest about himself, even if he's still not exactly an open book. Ellie is changing too, growing more confident and mature. She started out surprisingly smart, but brash and unthinking, reacting emotionally to anything that upset her. 
Side note, I'm often admittedly kind of annoyed at kid characters who are just swearing constantly in movies or games, but Ellie is one of the few that I just absolutely love in this regard. There's not really a sense that she's trying to be more grown up with it or anything like that, she's just incredibly precocious, has something of an attitude, and doesn't really have the patience to put up with anything. It gives her character, and it also helps us see her gain a bit of a calmer head as the game progresses. Anyway, in summation, this first part of the game is largely about introducing Joel and Ellie's relationship, as well as establishing Joel's attitude toward Ellie, before giving us an example of what their relationship might end up looking like if Joel refuses to accept her. The next section of the game is where we start to see a little bit of change. When the two lose their truck in a bandit ambush, they're forced to get out of the area on foot. At this point, Ellie is wanting more autonomy, but since Joel is beginning to settle into his role as the protector, he won't have any of it. He's accepting his need to protect her, and he's starting to see her as a human being instead of just cargo, but he's still not completely accepting her. A major step in this development is when she saves his life, and after his immediate stern parent reaction... I shot the hell out of that guy, huh? Yeah, you sure did. Uh, I feel sick. And you just hang back like I told you to. Can bring himself to admit that she saved him and give her a gun of her own. The second example of another relationship The Last of Us gives us is my personal favorite, Henry and Sam. These two come in at a time when Joel and Ellie are growing closer, but the relationship still hasn't fully formed. They're comfortable with each other, but not truly close, mostly due to Joel's continued issues with letting other people matter to him. Henry and Sam, on the other hand, are about as close as you'd expect of two brothers. Henry, being the oldest, protects Sam and trains him to live in this harsh world. Sam, what are you doing? Nothing. Get rid of it. My backpack is practically empty. What's the rule about taking stuff? It weighs like nothing. The rule? What is it? We only take what we have to. That's right. Now come on. And Sam seems to look up to Henry. It's the kind of relationship it would seem Joel and Ellie should have, and at this point, when they're kind of on the cusp of becoming a bit closer to each other, it really seems like Henry and Sam should be something of a model that Joel and Ellie should be trying to follow. But unfortunately, that model is not without its flaws, and some tragic ones at that. It becomes clear that Henry sees Sam as helpless, not out of any disrespect for him, but because he, much like Joel, views himself as the protector. He tries to train Sam to be a capable survivor, but never seems quite willing to actually let him play the part. While Joel and Ellie lack the emotional connection that Henry and Sam have, Joel is already treating Ellie as more capable and trustworthy. Henry sees Sam as his charge. Unfortunately, this relationship isn't actually ideal. Henry seems to define himself based on his need to protect Sam, and this driving need to make sure no harm comes to him robs Sam of any feeling of agency. Near the end of their chapter in the story, Sam talks to Ellie about fear. Did Henry send you? No. Why would Henry send me? To make sure I'm not fucking up somehow. I'd say we all did pretty good back there. Especially you. Is everything all right? Yeah, everything's fine. Okay. Well, have a good night. How is it that you're never scared? Who says that I'm not? What are you scared of? Uh, let's see. Scorpions are pretty creepy. Uh, being by myself. I'm scared of ending up alone. What about you? Those things out there. What if the people are still inside? What if they're trapped in there without any control of their body? I'm scared of that happening to me. He's always afraid because he hasn't been equipped to approach this dangerous life with any level of confidence. 
Henry's constant babying has left Sam constantly afraid of screwing things up, and he never truly felt like he was capable of handling himself. His fear of becoming like the infected is reflective of his general fear of having no control. Even now, he doesn't feel in control of anything, and to completely lose oneself is terrifying to him. To make things even more tragic, this conversation happens when Sam has been bitten, and is keeping it from the others. So the last blow to any feeling of agency he may have felt has already been dealt. He is going to die, and just as Henry has unintentionally taught him about life in general, there's absolutely nothing he can do. But he wasn't the only one to suffer from this relationship. When a fully infected Sam attacks Ellie the next day, Henry is forced to shoot him. And now, again due to his complete dedication to protecting Sam, he has nothing left. No reason to live, no good to accomplish in this world. Henry saw his brother's protection as the only worthwhile thing he could live for, and as a result, he unwittingly broke his brother's spirit and, when forced to kill Sam, took his own life. While the reason for this stands in contrast to Bill, in that Henry cares a lot about Sam and sticks with him rather than abandoning him, the core fear that leads to it, as well as the result of it, are quite similar. It all comes from the fear of losing someone you love. Henry's us was Sam, and his unhealthy fixation on attempting to keep him safe resulted in an unhealthy relationship that ended in tragedy. It serves as a good thematic foil to Bill. Over the course of the game so far, we've seen two diametrically opposed approaches to relationships, both of which resulted in similar problems and similar endings. And while Bill showed us the dangers of Joel's reluctance to accept Ellie and build a relationship with her, Henry and Sam show us the dangers of treating her as a responsibility rather than as an equal partner. Each of these instances effectively serves as a warning for Joel and Ellie's relationship. Detachment would lead to tragedy, but then so would coddling. The next segment is when their relationship finally reaches something of a healthy, functional form. Skip forward to fall and we get our next example. In some ways, it's more of a staging ground for the further development of Joel and Ellie than it is a full-fledged example like the ones we've talked about so far, but it is still worth looking at and, of course, it houses some of the more important character development of the whole game. Joel heads for the community that houses his brother, Tommy, in Wyoming, knowing that Tommy used to be a firefly and may know where they are. They come across them at a power plant, attempting to restore power to their nearby community, and we find out that Tommy has married the group's leader. It's clear that Joel and Tommy's relationship is strained, but they're happy to see each other again. We also get a fairly important moment to both Joel's character and our own role in this story. Tommy offers Joel a picture of Sarah. While he's looking at it, the game gives us a button prompt, and when we press it, he gives the picture back, refusing it. This is a telling element of our part in this story. The Last of Us asks us to interact with it, but ultimately our input can mostly only really come out to one thing whatever Joel would do. We can't decide whether he keeps or returns the photo, we can only prompt him to do as he would. Essentially, we're the ones moving the story forward, but we're not the ones determining how. This is one of many examples of how The Last of Us uses our interaction, but we're not going to truly understand the significance of this storytelling method or this particular example until the game takes us through its ending. You'll probably be able to imagine we'll be talking a lot about this when we get there. We find out that Joel doesn't want Tommy to give him the location of the Fireflies, he wants him to take Ellie there himself. He doesn't want to be responsible for her anymore. Here we're seeing the last vestiges of Joel's fear of becoming close to Ellie. He's getting closer to her, but he still fears what that might bring, and wants to take care of her while also separating himself from her. Tommy isn't happy about the idea, and we get further confirmation that Joel has done some pretty horrible things for the sake of survival. This is how you gonna repay me, huh? Repay you? For all those goddamn years I took care of us. Took care? That's what you call it? I got nothing but nightmares from those years. You survived because of me! It wasn't worth it. But when Joel helps fight off a group of bandits, Tommy agrees to take her. Upon catching wind of this plan, however, Ellie grabs a horse and runs off, prompting Joel and Tommy to take chase. Ellie has had a good deal of small details fleshing out her character, but it's times like this that we really are reminded that she is still a child. She's strong and capable and a very well-developed character, but she's also 14 years old, and doesn't necessarily always react to things in the most adult of ways. When they find her, one of the most pivotal scenes for both characters plays out. What do you want from me? 
Admit that you wanted to get rid of me the whole time. Tommy knows this area. Oh, better fuck than... that... Well, I'm sorry. I trust him better than I trust myself. Stop with the bullshit. What are you so afraid of? That I'm gonna end up like Sam? I can't get infected. I can take care of myself. How many close calls have we had? Well, we seem to be doing all right so far. And now you'll be doing even better with Tommy. Not her, you know. What? Maria told me about Sarah. Ellie? And... You are treading on some mighty thin ice here. I'm sorry about your daughter, Joel, but I have lost people too. You have no idea what loss is. Everyone I have cared for has either died or left me. Everyone fucking except for you. So don't tell me that I would be safer with someone else because the truth is I would just be more scared. sure as hell ain't your dad. It's here that we see that Ellie is scared too. Not scared of disappointing someone like Sam, nor is she so scared of losing someone like Joel is. She's not even really scared of dying. Her fear is one of abandonment. And interestingly enough, even if she doesn't really realize it, especially at this point, she's trying not to become like Joel. That last bit about how she'll be even more scared is pivotal here. If Joel abandons her, she'll become even less confident in any human relationships she has, constantly afraid of losing anyone she gets close to. Which is, albeit for slightly different reasons, basically the same problem Joel has. And it's because of that weakness of his that we see, in case it hasn't been quite obvious enough already, the difference in how these two approach relationships and communication. Joel is, quite frankly, scared of relationships, so he tries to brush them off and avoid talking about difficult or personal subjects, whereas Ellie, on the other hand, is kind of desperate for them and goes out of her way to build a relationship. And now that she has one with Joel, she just wants to keep it. We can see the transience of everything in the world of The Last of Us. From the need to use the broken remnants of the world to craft tools that break after one or two uses, to the simple disregard for life we see throughout the game, nothing seems to last long here. It's easy to see why both of these characters would long for something a little more permanent. This conversation is cut short by bandits, because even in a game this well written you can't go too long without needing to shoot people, a complicated weakness we'll talk more about later. But it's a pivotal conversation, both to our understanding of Joel and Ellie as characters and to the evolution of their own relationship. And this is when Joel makes the decision to take Ellie the rest of the way. It's clear that this decision is made as a result of their conversation back in that house, and it's the most important choice Joel makes in this game until the ending. This is him committing, him deciding it's worth the risk to foster his relationship with Ellie, to let his role as Ellie's bodyguard become his role as something more of a father figure. Taking a quick break to address Tommy and his part in the story's themes, his example is a bit less important than the others simply because he's more of a framing device for all that character development, but it's worth noting that he seems to be, far and away, the more healthy of the characters we see in the game, and his us is his community. His family, if you will. It's clear that his priority is on the community his wife runs, and we see a few examples of both of them being far more benevolent and kind than the previous authority figures we've seen. Earl? Yeah? Why are you here? Weren't you supposed to head back this morning? Still waiting on Hauser and the rest of the boys to relieve me. Oh, no. You know, we'll be fine. Just go home to your family. It's just a couple more hours. I'll tough it out. All right. Look, well, take it easy. And in an interesting twist, at this point his community family, the people he's sworn to protect and the people he's close to, have a higher place in his us than his blood brother does. What makes you think I'd do this for you? This isn't for me, Tommy. This is for your damn cause. My cause is my family now. For Tommy, us is the people who depend on him, the people he has a duty to organize and protect, and the fact that he married the leader of that community is symbolic of the way he sees that duty as no different from family. Back to Joel and Ellie, then. This is the healthiest their relationship ever becomes in this game. While Ellie generally insisted on following Joel wherever possible before, 
She's perfectly alright with it now, trusting that he's acting in her best interests and will be back. When Ellie asks about a difficult subject, Joel actually opens up a bit, and when it gets a little too personal for him, he gently admits that it's too much, instead of just stonewalling her like he used to. Have you ever been to one of these? What, the university? Yeah. <laughs> no, not as a student, at least. Why not? Uh... I had Sarah when I was pretty young. Were you married? For a while. What happened? Okay. Too much. The two have learned to work together and have meaningful, healthy interaction, and their dialogue and cooperation makes that clear. But unfortunately, the Fireflies have fled their previous headquarters for Salt Lake City, and when bandits show up, Joel is gravely injured. <laughs> I know I've been focusing a lot more on the basic literary analysis of this game so far and not talking so much about the interactive storytelling techniques of the game, and don't worry, I will be going a lot more into that later on in the analysis, but I do have to note that this sequence here is incredibly well done. Naughty Dog pioneered set-piece action design with the Uncharted series, but this is them turning that design methodology to narrative delivery, and it's gut-punchingly effective. The wavy screen and slow walking we've seen before, but Ellie's desperate assurances add tension to the scene, and Joel's involuntary stumblings as we struggle simply to move him forward. It's a painful scene to play, not only using audiovisual presentation, but calling on our interactivity in a minor way to make us acutely aware of how weak we are. Or perhaps more accurately for this particular game, how weak Joel is. It's just an excellent sequence. I think we're safe. Joel? Joel! Shit! Joel! Here! Oh, get up, get up, get up! You gotta tell me what to do! You gotta get up! Joel! And when we next see our heroes, it's winter. This chapter begins with a major perspective shift. We're playing as Ellie. I said before that perspective is possibly the game's most powerful interactive storytelling tool, and we'll talk a lot about what this means later on. Ellie isn't as strong or experienced as Joel, so she can't craft all the same things as him, and is far less capable in a brawl, but she can clearly handle herself. The opening scene with her, where you stalk through a snowy winter landscape hunting a deer, is one of the game's best scenes of calmness and serenity. Generally speaking, the game's most powerful and interesting moments tend to be in the moments of calm, but this is certainly one of the most beautiful and meditative of such segments. We're allowed to acclimate to playing as Ellie before everything gets intense again. And it's at that point that we meet David. Name's David. This here's my friend James. We're from a larger group. This whole sequence mostly exists to introduce David and give us an idea of Ellie's combat abilities and survival instincts. She's slow to trust and very smart and careful with how she goes about dealing with him. She's really grown a lot. Trade you for some of that meat there. What do you need? Weapons? Ammo? Clothes? Medicine! Do you have any antibiotics? Her desperation for medicine is the first confirmation we get that Joel is even still alive, and confirmation that the roles have switched. Ellie is now the protector, and has been forced to grow up a lot during the winter. Unfortunately, David reveals in an effectively chilling scene that the bandits Joel and Ellie killed at the university, and the people responsible for Joel's injury, were his people, and he's caught on to who she is. Nevertheless, he gives her the medicine and allows her to return and give it to Joel. And even though Ellie's much smarter now than she was, she doesn't realize that he'll be able to follow her. She manages to lead them away from Joel, but is captured herself in the process. The major function of this segment is to give Ellie a bit more agency in her own character growth. Up until this point, she's largely been defined in relation to Joel. Not really in the problematic damsel in distress sort of way, but defined by it nonetheless. But now, she's gonna have to act on her own, and it'll be her ideas, her actions, her skill that gets her out of her current situation. We see that David's community is a cannibalistic one, and when Ellie refuses to tell them where Joel is, in the most awesome Ellie-ish way possible, of course. What am I supposed to tell the others now? Ellie. What? Tell them that... Ellie is the little girl that broke your fucking finger! 
They almost chop her up before she uses the fact that she's infected to give them pause and escape. After a brief segue back to Joel to re-emphasize that he's not a particularly nice person, The girl. Is she alive? What girl? I don't know no girl. <laughs> I hate lying. I hate... <laughs> Fuck you, man. He told you what you wanted. I ain't telling you shit. That's all right. I believe it. No, wait! Ellie sneaks through David's compound in a tense, difficult sequence, culminating in a slow, quiet, difficult confrontation with David that ends on a seriously dark and important character moment for Ellie. You can try begging. Fuck you. You think you know me? Huh? Well, let me tell you something. You have no idea what I'm capable of. Ellie! Stop! Stop! Fucking touch me! It's okay. It's me. It's me. It's me. Look, look. It's me. He tried to... There are a couple important things to address here. Firstly, since it's easiest to just get this one out of the way, no, I don't think Ellie's character is at all weakened by crying in Joel's arms after all that. Those of you who watch this show regularly might have caught on that I'm pretty supportive of feminist issues in this medium, but in this instance, Joel did not save her. He simply showed up after she saved herself. And for reasons I'll go into in a second, this has been an incredibly traumatizing experience for her. The comfort of a father figure is no small thing after that. It's an action born of trust and closeness, not some kind of sexist need for the man to be supreme in everything. But more importantly, we must understand what just happened to Ellie. She's been near death before, sure, even convinced she was going to die after her initial bite, but never before has someone looked into her eyes, freaking mounted her, and slowly prepared to kill her in a painful, depraved manner. When she killed David, it wasn't only out of necessity. It was emotional. It was out of fear, desperation, and even emotional satisfaction. Can you even imagine how scary it must be to realize you just killed a man not only because you had to, but because you wanted to? That's what Joel was for before this. Like any good parental figure, he shielded Ellie from needing to do these difficult and depraved things, but now, with him having been out of the picture, she's the one who has had to do these terrible, terrifying things for the sake of her own survival. And Joel may be here to comfort her after all that, but he can't take away the responsibility for what she's done, however necessary it might have been. That concludes the winter chapter, so before we move on, we'll take a quick second to go over David and how his concept of us manifests in this game. Similar to how Henry and Sam were something of a thematic foil for Bill and Frank, David is a foil for Tommy. Before this sequence, with Tommy's group, we saw a community that valued human life and cooperation to the betterment of all. David's group, on the other hand, relies on humans for food and sending out raiding parties. It's technically the same us as Tommy, but his means of valuing and protecting them is significantly more morally depraved. So it's here that we see not only differences in how people define us, but also in how they go about valuing and protecting it, which is a very important thing to keep in mind as we go into this next and final chapter of the game. Ellie's demeanor has changed significantly, and she's far more downcast and responsive than usual. The game even displays this by interrupting one of the typical gameplay processes, and a nice little touch. Ellie? 
Ellie. What? The ladder. Come on. Right. In an interesting callback to a previous scene, Ellie explains that she took something from Tommy's compound and offers Joel the picture of Sarah. Maria showed this to me and I, uh, I stole it. I hope you don't mind. Before, you only had one action, and Joel refused the picture. Just as before, your interaction is limited to confirming with a button, but Joel takes it this time. Well, no matter how hard you try, I guess you can't escape your past. <laughs> Thank you. It's a sign of his character growth that he can accept it now and talk about it, and giving us control over the moment further emphasizes that his growth is not our doing. It's his. This, of course, leads into one of the more memorable scenes of the game, the giraffes. It's been established that animals can carry the infection but can't actually succumb to it, and posters inform us that these giraffes were on display at the local zoo when the outbreak first hit. Now the game, as it often does, slows down and allows us to enjoy a slow, beautiful moment for as long as we want. The sequence doesn't end until you leave. The symbolism of the giraffe is fairly inconsistent as far as any of my research could determine, but thankfully, The Last of Us kind of brings its own symbolism into the picture. I suppose now's as good a time as any to talk about the game's themes of nature. The game is filled with imagery of urban landscapes being reclaimed by nature, as are many post-apocalyptic stories, but the unique touch of this game in particular is that even the apocalypse itself is brought on by nature. Talking to a plastic plant. I'm still doing Yes, apparently that can be done right. The big picture setup of The Last of Us is literally nature reclaiming the world from humanity. But where many works would state that that is the way of things, and take the position that humanity is some sort of plague upon the natural world, The Last of Us is pointing out the similarities between the two. Just as humanity has converted nature to serve our needs, so too has the cordyceps infection used humanity. And just as humanity is ugly, destructive, and evil, so too can it be peaceful, beautiful, and righteous. While The Last of Us depicts a world being slowly reconquered by nature, it also reflects on humanity itself. And this comparison, this relationship to the nature of humanity and the nature of the natural world, is why the giraffe scene is so beautiful. It shows us that, for all the ugliness we've seen thus far, there is still beauty, both in nature and in humanity. Which is good, because it's the last we'll see of it. Joel and Ellie end up facing a near-death experience again, punctuated by a beautiful visual that accurately represents Joel's priorities at this point in the story, and are mistaken for bandits and taken in by force to the Firefly's base of operations. When Joel wakes up, Marlene is there, assuring him that his job is done and he can leave now. But obviously, Joel has bigger concerns than that and demands to see Ellie. Take me to her. You don't have to worry about her anymore. We'll take care I of her. I worry. Just let me see her, please. You can't. She's being prepped for surgery. The hell do you mean, surgery? The doctors tell me the cordyceps, the growth inside her, has somehow mutated. It's why she's immune. Once they remove it, they'll be able to reverse engineer a vaccine. A vaccine. But it grows all over the brain. It does. Find someone else. There is no one else. Listen, you were gonna show me where- Stop. I get it. But whatever it is you think you're going through right now is nothing to what I have been through. I knew her since she was born. I promised your mother I would look after her. Then why are you letting this happen? Because this isn't about me, or even her. There is no other choice here. It's interesting to note how many characters at this point, Joel included, have tried to invalidate the pain of others by claiming their own is significantly worse, instead of trying to understand each other's pain. In any case, Joel is not having any of this. And here we are. The ending to this game is kind of controversial, so I'm fairly certain my interpretation of it is going to have a couple detractors, but after a good long while of discussing, researching, and thinking about it, I'm fairly confident in my assessment of what the game was going for, as well as what it ultimately comes out to. So, let's dive in.
There's not really a good time to interrupt all this, but we do need to talk about Marlene, because she's the final example character of the story. Her us is the broadest of the game. Humanity. Her ultimate goal is to save humankind from both the Cordyceps and itself, as exemplified in the Fireflies attempts to find a cure, as well as their rebellion against the military establishment. Interestingly enough, we find during this last segment that much of this is actually inspired by her close relationship with Ellie's mother. So even Marlene's dedication to the whole of humanity is motivated by a personal relationship, but it ultimately takes precedence. She promised to protect Ellie when her mother died, but her role in saving humanity was more important, and she made a difficult decision to give Ellie's life for the good of the human race. After once again using torture to find out what he needs to know, Joel shoots his way through the Firefly's compound to get to Ellie, and when he does, we're given another scenario where we must do something to move the game forward, but ultimately we don't have much choice as to what. I need to no! Joel takes Ellie and escapes. You can't save her. Even if you get her out of here, then what? How long before she's torn to pieces by a pack of clickers? That is, if she hasn't been raped and murdered first. It ain't for you to decide. It's what she'd want. And you know it. Look. You can still do the right thing here. She won't feel anything. are still wearing off. What happened? We found the fireflies. Turns out there's a whole lot more like you, Ellie. People that are immune. There's dozens, actually. Ain't time a damn bit of good, neither. They've actually... They've stopped looking for a cure. I'm taking us home. I'm sorry. As they approach Tommy's community, the game gives us one last shift in perspective, putting us in Ellie's shoes for the last few minutes of the game, before this conversation brings an end to the story. Back when I was bitten, I wasn't alone. My best friend was there, and she got bit too. We didn't know what to do, so... She says, let's just wait it out. You know, we can be all poetic and just lose our minds together. I'm still waiting for my turn. Ellie. Her name was Riley, and she was the first to die. And then it was Tess. And then Sam. None of that is on you. You don't understand. I struggled. For a long time with surviving. And you... No matter what... 
You keep finding something to fight for. Now, I know that's not what you want to hear right now. Swear now, to me. Swear to me that everything that you've said about the Fireflies is true. I swear. is, as you might imagine, kind of a difficult and conflicting ending. As it was meant to be, and to that end, the execution is nothing short of masterful. Now at this point I've done my best to make the relationships and themes of the story clear up to this point by going over the development of Joel and Ellie's relationship as well as the examples given by the secondary characters. Now it's time to take all of that information and bring it together to try and figure out what The Last of Us is trying to tell us with this ending. the game's ultimate meaning and themes before talking about the, how the interactive elements reinforce them and cement this game as quite possibly the definitive example of its generation of games. So first up, why did Joel do what he did? Was it right? And what does his decision to lie to Ellie at the end mean about the story? I'm not going to say that Joel didn't care about Ellie. He clearly did, quite a bit, and they were on their way to building a very positive relationship. But Ultimately, The Last of Us is the story of a man who, despite excelling at survival and the difficult skills of this post-apocalyptic world, is ultimately weak. There honestly aren't all that many video games that can say that about their protagonist. I think Miracle of Sound said it best, and yeah, I know I mentioned him in another analysis too, but just let me fanboy a bit, in his song based on The Last of Us. Ellie filled the gap left in the wake of Sarah's death, and she's ultimately something of a surrogate for Joel's lost daughter. When a relationship ends, one way or another, it can take some time to really recover from it, and for that matter, it can be quite unhealthy to start building another similar relationship when the ruins of an old one are still heavily affecting you. This is why, for instance, we generally recommend waiting a little while between romantic relationships. You need some time for the pain to heal and to build a new relationship that's free of any previous expectations, positive or negative. Joel did not do this. At least, not well. The game makes it pretty clear that even after 20 years, he has not been able to move past his daughter's death very effectively. This is made pretty clear with a lot of examples, from the broken watch to his avoidance of the topic, so I, I think it's already been established pretty well. So when Ellie came along, Joel eventually did the right thing in choosing to build a relationship with her. The problem is that he built that relationship, metaphorically speaking, on the ruins of his relationship with Sarah. Rather than being a new relationship for him to foster, Ellie simply took the place of an old one, one that Joel was not willing or perhaps even psychologically capable of giving up. When faced with a decision to potentially save the world or keep this relationship, Joel chose to do everything in his power to maintain it. But while the action of saving a helpless girl is generally considered a heroic thing, and many players have interpreted this scenario in that same way, in this case it really isn't. But not only did Joel act against the interest of humanity, he ultimately didn't do it for Ellie's sake. Marlene even said it. This is what Ellie would want, and Joel knew it. I think it's pretty clear given Ellie's character that given the opportunity to save the human race, even just a chance at doing it, she would give her own life. There's a lot of dialogue in this game about her wanting to make a difference and hoping that their journey isn't all for nothing. She knows that she can do something important, and she really wants to. To be entirely fair, the Fireflies really should have woken Ellie up and gotten her consent before doing this, but that still does not change the fact that Ellie would have done this of her own accord. And Joel knows that. That's why he lied to her. But ultimately, Ellie's wishes didn't matter in this scenario. 
Joel made his decision based on his own desires, not Ellie's and certainly not on the needs of humanity as a whole. In other words, Joel's us is him and Ellie, and true to his character, he's willing to do anything, no matter the cost or the morality, to maintain that. And beyond that, there are some understandable reasons why Joel is not too keen on the idea of sacrificing for the sake of the greater good. The greater good. He lost his daughter when a soldier was ordered to sacrifice potentially infected civilians to keep the larger population safe. He lived in a compound controlled by strict, violent martial law for the sake of the greater good. He explains to Ellie how the quarantine zones would close off to civilians and kill everyone outside so there would be less infected, to which Ellie quite understandably responds. It's kind of shitty. Yeah. Joel's life has been more or less defined by loss for the sake of the greater good, and he's lived his life in defiance of that concept, caring for absolutely no one but himself and his own. Combine that with the fact that he clearly still hasn't dealt with the death of his daughter in a particularly healthy way, and it becomes fairly obvious why he would make a decision at such great cost to humanity for the sake of his own weakness. And this is why the final perspective shift to Ellie is so important. When playing as the hero of an action game, it can be hard to see them as anything other than a strong, capable person worthy of our respect. But from Ellie's perspective in this ending sequence, Joel seems... pathetic. I don't think I ever told you, but, uh, Sarah and I used to take hikes like this. I think, uh, I think the two of you would have been, would have been good friends. He's a sad old man, reminiscing about what he's lost. And much like in real life, that's something we can see a lot more clearly when we're outside of his own perspective. Similarly to the opening sequence playing as Sarah, the effect is subtle enough that we may not even realize it's there, but it's far easier to see Joel for what he is when looking at him from the outside. Which leads us to a major question surrounding the game's storytelling. A notable criticism of The Last of Us is the difference between the gameplay and the cutscenes. The Last of Us, as a game, is about killing zombies and soldiers with guns and cobbled together weaponry. The Last of Us, as a story, is about relationships and emotional scars. And the two share very little connection. This is actually a lot of why I said that The Last of Us is something of a capstone on its generation. The eight years or so prior to the release of this game saw a major rise in action set-piece games that told their story primarily through cutscenes while the gameplay focused on action and, yeah, sometimes even crafting systems of dubious necessity. The Last of Us is something of a swan song of its generation, one of the last great works that exemplifies many of the trends that grew during that time. But this ultimately means that gameplay and story are disconnected from each other, in a way. The context is perfectly appropriate, so there's not really an issue of ludonarrative dissonance going on, but The Last of Us wants to be remembered as an emotional story of broken relationships, but when you're playing it, you're spending most of your time shanking zombies. That is kind of weird. But it's also completely normal. For games of its time, at least, and until this medium has more universally found ways to design compelling interaction around social situations and emotional struggles, I find it kind of hard to actually hold this against The Last of Us, especially since it does actually use this element of itself in some pretty interesting narrative ways. In video games, there's an extent to which we identify with the character we're playing as. There are a number of different ways to look at the player-avatar relationship, but Joel is very much what I described in a previous episode of this show as an independent protagonist. He is who he is, and nothing the game is going to let you do will change that. But that doesn't necessarily change the fact that you relate to him. You're working hard toward the same goals he is, and most games bank on your perception that you're doing the right thing, so we tend to automatically consider our in-game goals as noble and our player character as righteous. The Last of Us expects that, and yet makes it clear that, ultimately, we're not Joel, and our motivations aren't necessarily his. Joel is Joel. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's great to take a level of ownership in an interactive story, but as I've said many times on this show when talking about minor narrative interactivity, an artist with a creative vision can also use interactivity to make their story more powerful without letting the player alter its events, and that's no less legitimate or powerful a use of interactivity than a game with moral choices and branching storylines. 
This is why I made such a big deal about the fact that you can't choose what he does with the pictures earlier, and the same basic principle comes into play in the gameplay constantly. The game lets us ride along, but this isn't our story. It's Joel's. And in this game, that's not an incidental element of linear storytelling. It's intentional, and it has a major effect on how we view the character and his actions. But this is also why the game changes our perspectives like it does. I mentioned earlier about how playing as Sarah in the beginning of the game cements Joel's role as the protector in our minds. And similarly, whenever the game shifts perspective, it's hammering in a pretty simple point. We are not Joel. We're simply participating in his story. Some would argue this negates the power of interactivity, but I would quite strongly disagree. This game knows exactly what it is and how it's utilizing our interaction, and it uses that to its benefit. Joel's decision at the end of the game is nothing short of a betrayal to Ellie as well as the human race, and because we identify so closely with our player character, and very specifically because of that interactivity, we're victims of that betrayal as well. So ultimately, The Last of Us is a game about relationships, about the importance of understanding who your us is and what you're willing to do for them, and possibly even more importantly, understanding what they would want from you in the first place. And with the ending left as open as it is, it's hard to say for sure whether Ellie actually believes Joel and what will happen afterward, but I think it's safe to say their relationship has been strained. Breaches of trust will do that. And in the end, we get no resolution, no confirmation of whether Joel was right or wrong, or how Ellie will treat him in the long run. This game isn't about that. It's not about the world, it's not about whether or not Joel and Ellie can survive afterwards, it's, it's not about any of that, it's about their relationship. Instead, we're left with the same question Ellie and Joel will likely be asking themselves for the rest of their lives. Will this relationship ever truly recover from this? And thus concludes my analysis of The Last of Us. I hope it was informative and helped you to further understand and appreciate this excellent game. If you want to hear more from me, make sure to click the subscribe button down there, and also follow Games as Literature on Facebook and Twitter. And if you really like what you see in this channel, please consider supporting the show on Patreon. That link is also down in the description. Due to both the amount of work that went into this analysis and some pretty major changes coming up in my personal life, Games is Lit 101 is taking a break next week. But after that, we'll be back with an episode about what it looks like for a game's ludic and narrative elements to be in complete harmony with each other. And next month on Literary Analysis, we're going to be taking a look at a game that questions the very nature of narrative and the relationship between the player and the storyteller. So until next week, or until the week after next I guess. Class dismissed.